Hello everybody. This is a first live episode of uh, Anesthesia Tools and uh, we are discussing about uh, neuromuscular monitoring, the basic principles and the methods of uh, neuromuscular monitoring. The types of nerve stimulation right from the time of innovation of uh, nerve stimulators are uh, classified into electrical or magnetic methods. Electrical ones are involving painful stimulus, but there is a positive thing about it is ease of maintenance and uh, the equipment is handy. Coming to magnetic uh, type of nerve stimulation, it's less painful, does not require physical contact, but the equipment is heavy and bulky and it cannot be used for a train of four and it is difficult to achieve supramaximal stimulation. Okay, I said uh, supramaximal stimulation. We all know that nerve conduction involves something called as the all or none phenomenon, all or none pattern. So the stimulus must be truly maximal throughout the period of monitoring. Therefore, the electrical stimulus applied is usually at least 20 to 25% above that necessary for a maximal response. For this reason, the stimulus is said to be supra maximal. The characteristics of an ideal nerve stimulator, it should be battery operated. It should be able to deliver a constant current up to a maximum of 80 milliampers. It can only deliver a constant voltage. The pulse stimulus should no longer should be lasting no longer than 0.3 milliseconds. The pulse stimulus should be of a monophasic square wave type. The adequacy of electrical contact should be displayed on the monitor screen. The polarity of the electrode leads should be indicated. It is recommended that the negative electrode be placed directly over the most superficial part of the nerve. The positive electrode can then be placed on a position along the course of the nerve, usually proximal to avoid direct muscle stimulation. The nerve stimulator should be capable of delivering a variety of patterns of stimulation, including single twitch, usually at one hertz, Train of four twist stimulation, usually two hertz with at least a 10 second interval between trains. Tetanic stimulation of 50 hertz for up to five seconds and double burst stimulation or DBS. The ideal stimulator would also enable monitoring of evoked responses. Now we will see the different patterns of nerve stimulation as we do for our clinical use. Single twist stimulation. This is a single square wave supramaximal stimulus, which is applied to a peripheral nerve for a period of about 0.2 milliseconds at regular intervals and the evoked response is observed. The major limitation to this technique is the need to measure a controlled twitch before administering the neuromuscular blocking agent, which actually is a painful stimulus. And the control twitch actually disappears if you are not having an objective recording on the monitor. If you are relying on the visual or tactile response, you may miss the baseline response. The favorite uh, train of force stimulation. It was developed in uh, 1970 by Ali and colleagues, the principle was to produce a pattern of stimulation that did not require the comparison of evoke responses to a controlled response obtained before the administration of the neuromuscular blocking drug. So even without giving a stimulus and recording the control response, we can administer the neuromuscular blocking drug and then see the response because there are four responses we can always take the first one as the benchmark to see how it evolves or uh, demonstrate 
or the response pattern we can check the pattern involves stimulating the ulnar nerve with a train of force supra maximal twitch stimuli with a frequency of 2 hertz that is four stimuli each separated by 0.5 seconds the tof was then repeated every 10 seconds that is train frequency of 0.1 hertz now this is the pattern we get with non depolarizing neuromuscular blockade in the pattern is given above you can see the phenomenon of fade that means after few responses the fourth response gradually diminishes then the third one diminishes and the second one diminishes with respect to the first one so there is a progressive fade and later on the fourth one disappears the third one disappears even the second one or even the first can disappear in deep block and once you give neostigmin the twitches return in the recovery phase okay first we will get the first twitch back second twitch back again then third twitch and now fourth twitch and the adequacy of response we can see by what is called as tof ratio that is the amplitude of the fourth one with respect to the first stimulation that is the tof ratio see the difference in the pattern with regard to succinyl choline or depolarizing neuromuscular blockade here the response diminution is uniform from the first response to the fourth response there is a uniform reduction in the twitch height in all four responses and in deeper blocks all four comes down or disappears and during recovery all four comes back at the same amplitude during onset of non depolarizing block the fourth twitch disappears at about 75% depression of T1, T3 at 80 to 85% depression of T1, T2 at 90% depression. During partial non depolarizing block, the number of twitches, we call it as TOF count, TOF count, and that correlates with the degree of neuromuscular block. Twitch suppression of 90% would equate to a tough count of one or less reversal of residual neuromuscular block can safely be achieved when the tough count is three or greater next pattern is tetanic stimulation tetanic stimulation uses a high frequency 50 to 200 hertz with a supramaximal stimulus for a set time normally it is five seconds in healthy skeletal muscle during normal movement the response is maintained as tetanic contraction here you can see the response the tetanic stimulation is very closely packed okay this is 50 hertz stimulation the difference or interval between two different separate stimuli are 20 milliseconds in 50 hertz stimulation you can see an elevated amplitude and this is the sustained elevated amplitude response during tetanic stimulation on administration of a neuromuscular depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agent the muscle depending on the degree of block will show signs of fade that is the stimulated muscle will be unable to sustain a muscle contraction at higher frequencies like 100 to 200 hertz the muscular fatigue may develop but at a stimulation frequency of uh, 50 hertz this should not occur and the degree of fade will correspond more closely to the degree of neuromuscular block technique stimulation this pattern is very sensitive and can elicit minor degrees of neuromuscular block which is potentially useful in the post-operative recovery room. However, its use is limited by the fact that tetanic stimulation is extremely painful. See, the acetylcholine released during a tetanic stimulus into the synaptic cleft has a positive feedback effect through its action on the 
presynaptic receptors. So these actions ensure that the amount of acetylcholine released from the nerve terminal is far greater than which is required to generate an adequate end plate potential and sustain a tetany contraction. In the presence of non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agent, this margin of safety is greatly reduced. The competitive block at the presynaptic receptors decreases the amount of acetylcholine mobilized and released, contributing to a fade seen during tetany stimulation. During partial depolarizing block, fade is not observed in response to tetanic stimulation. The amplitude of the evoked response will be lower, but the tetanic contraction will be maintained. Now, the next mode you have to understand is post tetanic count, PTC. If a 5 second tetanic stimulus at 50 Hz is administered after no twitch response has been elicited, followed 3 seconds later by single twitches at 1 hertz. There may be a response to single twitch stimulation. A response will be seen in early stages of recovery before the TOF reappears. This is known as post tetanic facilitation. On completion of a tetanic stimulus, acetylcholine synthesis and mobilization continue for a short period. As a result, there is an increased immediately available store of acetylcholine which causes an enhanced response to subsequent single twitch stimulation. The number of post tetanic twitches is an indication of when the first twitch of the TOF will reappear. For instance, the first twitch of the TOF generally returns with a post tetanic count of 9 when using atracurium or vicuronium. The main use of PTC is when profound neuromuscular block is required, for example, during retinal surgery, when movement or coughing could have been could have devastating effects, we have to use post tetanic count. It should be remembered that a tetanic stimulus by mobilizing acetylcholine might affect the neuromuscular junction of a stimulated nerve for a significant time. Therefore, it is recommended that the tetanic stimulus should not be repeated for a period of six minutes. Here you can see the PTC pattern. Here is the tetanic stimulus of 50 Hertz. As I said, uh, each stimulus is separated by an interval of 20 milliseconds. And see the response. There is an elevated response amplitude followed by twitches in response to single twitch after the tetanic count. Here we actually administer a non depolarizing relaxant. Tetanic count is uh, tetanic stimulus is applied and you get a fade in the response. And this tetanic stimulus is followed by single twitches and you can see an elevated amplitude or response with moderate non depolarizing block and it again shows a fading trend okay so here again you can see the TOF stimulus during intense block there is no response so we try to use the tetanic stimulus and post tetanic stimulation so here you can see the use of uh, tetanic stimulus and post tetanic stimulus and no response that shows there is intense block. B situation, again TOF, there is no response. Again, you go for a tetanic stimulus, no response. After giving post tetanic stimulus, you get one response. Wait for some more time, go to scenario three, no response with TOF, post tetanic, we are getting three responses. And now coming to the surgical block or lesser dense block, TOF response, we get a marginal, a small evoked response for with the first uh, twitch, then post tetanic response. You can see there is response, good number of responses with post tetanic stimulus. So as the muscle comes out from the intense block, TOF 
will start to help us to indicate the degree of block. But during this intense block, postnatal count is the one to give you an idea whether the patient is in a recovery track or not. One more mode of uh, stimulation is double burst stimulation or DBS. It consists of two short bursts of 50 hertz tetanic stimulation separated by 750 milliseconds interval. The duration of each square wave impulse in the burst is 0.2 millisecond. Here you can see the TOF is giving response and with double burst. Here actually we give three set of three in the first instant followed by a 750 millisecond interval from the first stimulus to the next set again a set of three. So it is called as DBS 3-3. Three, three. But you get one response for a set of technique responses. So you get two responses after DBS 3-3. Three, three. Okay, again during recovery pattern, this is the control part. The recovery pattern, you can see the TOF response and the DBS response is much more exaggerated so that even with the tactile or visual mode, you can identify. That is the advantage of DBS. So as the recovery progresses, you can see the this is the TOF ratio. The, as TOF ratio improves, the amplitude of the second response also improves. Actually, these two correlate. The TOF ratio with the train of force stimulus and the DBS 3-3 ratios almost correlate. DBS 3-3 ratio, the amplitude of the second response is divided by the amplitude of the first response. Measured mechanically, the TOF ratio correlates closely with the DBS 3-3 ratio. The tactile evaluation of the response to DBS 3-3 is superior to tactile evaluation of the response to TOF stimulation, as I mentioned. Now, when do we need the neuromuscular monitoring? Situation one, after prolonged infusions of neuromuscular blocking drugs or when long acting drugs are used, you want to know whether your uh, depth of neuromuscular blocking is adequate or patient is recovering or how much is recovering from the prolonged or intense or long acting neuromuscular blockade. Second, when surgery or anesthesia is prolonged because there are a number of reasons which can alter the response to neuromuscular blockade. So we need to monitor it. When inadequate reversal may have devastating effects, for example, severe respiratory disease, morbid obesity, we need to know when exactly we can remove the endotracheal tube and, or proceed with the extubation. In conditions where the administration of a reversal agent may cause harm, for example, tachyarrhythmias, cardiac failure, where you don't want to play around with the uh, drugs, anticholinergic drugs, so you have to have an endpoint when we can extubate without even administering the reverse agent. This is an objective method of making sure that the patient has recovered adequately from the neuromuscular blockade. Next scenario is when hepatic or renal dysfunction is there when pharmacokinetics of muscle relaxants may be altered. Next, neuromuscular disorders such as myasthenia gravis or Eaton Lambert syndrome, we need to have an idea of what exactly happens at the level of neuromuscular junction. And now, where to put the stimulus electrodes, sites of nerve stimulation, and different muscle responses? In principle, any superficially located peripheral motor nerve may be stimulated. Ulna nerve is the most popular site. The median or posterior tibial, common peroneal and facial nerves are also sometimes used. The polarity of the electrodes is less crucial when both the electrodes are close to each other at the volar side of the wrist. However, the placement of the negative electrode distally normally elicits the greatest neuromuscular response as we showed in the diagram before. Because different muscle groups have different sensitivities to neuromuscular blocking agents, Results obtained for one muscle group cannot be extrapolated automatically to the other muscles. For example, the diaphragm is among the most resistant of all the muscles 
to both depolarizing and non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking drugs. In general, the diaphragm requires 1.4 to 2 times as much muscle relaxant as adductor pollicis muscle for an identical degree of blockade. The onset time is normally shorter for the diaphragm than for the adductor pollicis muscle and that the diaphragm recovers from paralysis much more quickly than do the peripheral muscles. Possible causes may be differences in acetylcholine receptor density, acetylcholine release, acetylcholine esterase activity, fiber composition, innervation ratio that is the number of neuromuscular junctions, the blood flow to the muscle and the muscle temperature. Now we go into something more objective, the recording of evoked responses. There are a different uh, set of uh, methods to record the response. It's not only really the visual or tactile uh, monitoring of the evoked responses. We can use the mechanomyography, electromyography, acceleromyography, piezoelectric neuromuscular monitors, or phonomyography. I'm not going to the details of uh, each technique. Uh, whichever technique you are familiar like uh, uh, mechanomyography, axillomyography, which is available in your institution, you should be familiar. And you have to read up the uh, physical principles behind that recording. Here is the evaluation of the recorded evoked responses. Train of four, before the actual onset, you get the normal responses. Then the fade starts, that means the Subsequent responses will have lesser amplitude. And then fourth one disappears, third disappears, second disappears, and maybe a silent, no response for some time. Then on the recovery side, the first one slightly appears, then first one with second one, third one joins, fourth one also appears. And keeping the trend, they gradually rise. And as the recovery is more complete, the fourth will almost reach the amplitude of the first one. That means uh, TOF ratio approaches well beyond the 0.9 and above. Patient is ready for extubation. So this is the intense neuromuscular blockade phase. This is the surgical blockade and last one will be the recovery. The TOF ratio, whether recorded mechanically or by EMG, must exceed 0.8 or even 0.9 to exclude clinically important residual neuromuscular blockade. Moderate degrees of neuromuscular block decrease the chemoreceptor sensitivity to hypoxia, leading to insufficient response to a decrease in oxygen tension in blood. The residual block, TOF less than 0.9, is associated with disadvantages like functional impairment of the muscles of the pharynx and upper esophagus, most probably predisposing to regurgitation and aspiration. Something more on uh, depolarizing neuromuscular blockade because uh, most of the fade and other things we have described are for intermediate to long acting non depolarizing muscle relaxants. Now we are coming to depolarizing neuromuscular blockade because the amplitude per se comes down unless we have a proper controlled response. We will not be knowing how much the amplitude has come down or how much more the amplitude has to come back during recovery. Patients with normal pl plasma choline esterase activity who are given a moderate dose of succinylcholine of 0.5 to 1.5 milligram per kg undergo a typical depolarizing neuromuscular block and we can call it as phase 1 block which of course means there is something called phase 2 block. The response to TOF or tetanic stimulation there is no fade, no post-tetanic facilitation of transmission occurs. In some patients with a genetically determined abnormal plasma choline esterase activity who are given the same dose of succinylcholine undergo a non-depolarizing like block characterized by fade in response to TOF and tetanic stimulation and occurrence of post-tetanic facilitation of transmission. This type of block is called phase 2 block. It's also called dual mixed or desensitizing block. Phase 2 blocks sometimes occur in genetically normal patients after 
prolonged infusion or repeated doses of succinylcholine. So here you can see the response after giving succinylcholine, the fade appears. Then like you see in non-depolarizing blocker, some absent response and during recovery also, the fade is very much evident. You can see the duration, it is 50 minutes, 60 minutes. After a single dose of succinylcholine, we don't expect uh, this much duration. So when the block goes to this duration, this much duration, there is every likelihood that uh, you are coming across phase two blockade. In normal patients, a phase two block can be antagonized by administering cholinesterase inhibitor neostrepine a few minutes after discontinuation of succinylcholine. But in patients with abnormal genotypes, the effect of intravenous injection of acetylcholine nesterase inhibitor like neostigmine is unpredictable. Therefore, unless the cholinesterase genotype is known to be normal, antagonism of phase two block with the cholinesterase inhibitor should be undertaken with extreme caution or to be avoided. Even if the neuromuscular function improves promptly, patient surveillance should continue for at least one hour. Now, where do we appropriately use the, use the neuromuscular monitoring? Single titch can be used uh, during induction because sometimes we need to limit the laryngoscopy response or raise the intracranial pressure, especially when the patient is on enzyme inducers. So to know that there is single twitch suppression before you proceed with the laryngoscopy, supramaximal stimulation uh, during induction and tracheal intubation is appropriate. Beyond that, single twitch uh, stimulus has uh, not much role. TOF can be used to see the twitch suppression before attempting tracheal intubation. Intense neuromuscular blockade, you may not get any response with the uh, trainer for stimulus but when it eases off to moderate blockade and going into reversal there is a role for there is definitely that is the most popular role for a trainer for and in the recovery room it is questionable because unless we have an objective response monitoring system this is not going to be useful plus uh, an awake patient uh, giving stimulus is painful too post tetany count, we are uh, using it to distinguish or to see the or monitor the intense level of blockade for some specific surgeries. And that will give you an indication of the recovering pattern much before TOF starts to reappear. Double burst stimulus, since the evoke response is more amplified, it is more uh, indicative and it can be used for during reversal and maybe in the recovery room as well. Clinical tests for uh, post-operative neuromuscular recovery is uh, mostly unreliable. These are the things that uh, was used in the clinical practice, sustained eye opening, protrusion of the tongue, arm lift to opposite shoulder, normal tidal volume, normal or near normal vital capacity, maximal inspiratory pressure uh, to the range of 40 to 50 centimeters of water, Reliable ones among these are sustained head lift for uh, five seconds or more, sustained leg lift for five seconds, sustained hand grip for five seconds, sustained uh, tongue depressor test, and maximum inspiratory pressure above 40 to 50 centimeters of water. So in summary, residual post-operative neuromuscular block causes uh, decreased chemoreceptor sensitivity to hypoxia, functional impairment of the muscles of the pharynx and upper esophagus, impaired ability to maintain the airway and an increased risk for the development of post-operative pulmonary complications. It is difficult and often impossible by clinical evaluation of recovery of neuromuscular function to exclude with certainty clinically significant residual curarization. Absence of tactile fade in response to tough stimulation, tetanic stimulation and DBS does not exclude significant residual block. Adequate recovery of postoperative neuromuscular function cannot be guaranteed without objective neuromuscular blocking. Yes, there is good evidence-based practice 
the dictates that the clinician should always quantitate the extent of neuromuscular blockade using objective monitoring. To exclude clinically significant residual neuromuscular blockade, the TOF ratio when measured mechanically or by electromyography must exceed 0.9. Avoid total twitch depression during surgery. Keep whenever possible one or two TOF responses unless specifically indicated for the surgery. If sufficient recovery, that is TOF more than 0.9, has not been documented objectively at the end of surgical procedure, the neuromuscular block should be antagonized pharmacologically. Okay, this is in nutshell regarding the neuromuscular monitoring. This is a good practice to include this in your post-induction monitors, which will help you actually to make sure that you are attaining the desired uh, uh, respiratory or uh, desired uh, neuromuscular depth of monitoring and that will, is going to help you avoid the adverse effects of uh, your uh, procedures like laryngoscopy. Uh, so it is always better to keep it in the practice. So uh, that's it for the time being and uh, thank you very much for watching. This has been the first uh, live uh, presentation in anesthesia tools. We are looking forward to using the new uh, newer modes of uh, uh, online presentation media for anesthesia tools. Thanks again for watching. It's goodbye from Sanish. Thank you.